So welcome to the Picture Language Seminar. We're very pleased today to have Peter Love. He's a professor of physics at Tuft University, and he's also on the Scientific Advisory Board, in fact, chair of the Scientific Advisory Board for Zapata Computing. He's an expert on quantum simulation, and we're looking forward very much to his talk about contextual subspace variational quantum eigensolver. So Peter, share your screen and we're looking forward very much to your talk. Great. Great. Is that working? Yes, it is. Great. So um, thank you ever so much for the opportunity to tell you about this work. Um, in fact, before the pandemic, um, I also spoke in this uh, seminar um, when it was in person. In fact, I think that was the last in-person talk I gave before the start of the pandemic. So I hope that is not auspicious. Um, but the, the, I spoke then about the early results. So this talk will kind of serve as an update of what we've been doing since. So this is work done in collaboration with my uh, former student, Will Kirby, who just graduated and went off to IBM to keep working on quantum computing there. Andrew Transer, who's now at Quantinuum, which is the partnership of Cambridge Quantum Computing and Honeywell. Alexi Rally and Tim Weaving, who are students at UCL, Peter Coveney, who's a professor at UCL and also was my PhD advisor a long time ago, uh, and myself. And I have the wrong date on this slide, so I apologize for that. Um, so I just wanted to uh, start with a little picture. Um, my, I have the great fortune to be married to an astronomer, so the most exciting thing happening in astronomy at the moment is the James Webb Space Telescope, which is invading our house with all these wonderful pictures that my wife keeps showing me. And the thing that is very, I always very, find very striking uh, when I'm talking to astronomers is they have a large collection of what they call standard candles. So this is how you just tell in these two-dimensional images how far away something is, which tells you, is it a galaxy? Is it you know, a planet? Is it and so on and so forth. So there's a long, you know, some of these we all know, redshift is the what most familiar perhaps. Um, there's parallax, which is the simplest, but there's all these other uh, observations you can make that help you discriminate between different uh, types of objects. So I just want to start with a rather forced analogy uh, between that and the business of trying to find problems where quantum computers might actually be useful. So we have a much actually larger universe of problems if you think about the space of all possible optimization problems or all possible quantum simulation problems. It's beyond astronomically vast. Um, and we do still suffer from great difficulty in picking out examples where we know or we suspect or we have evidence that quantum computing can really provide us a strong advantage. And so the, the, the analogy I'm trying to draw here is that we sort of lack standard candles for the quantum difficulty of various problems. But we do have a whole bunch of candidates quantities like entanglement or contextuality, which is will appear in this talk, discord, magic, negativity, um, t-count, and so on and so on and so on. So although we don't really have standard candles in the sense that we don't have a good correspondence between any of these quantities and the thing we would really like to know, uh, which is the possibility to achieve some kind of quantum advantage for problems, one can still have some hope that the foundations of quantum mechanics should help help us distinguish classical and quantum classical from quantum in in the world of problems and that's really what this talk is about it's one uh method that uh we think is interesting in and of itself but is also an example of trying to draw a distinction between what's classical and what's quantum in an algorithm okay so that's the analogy over so let's just show you the show you the plan so I'm going to talk about three things in this direction. One is testing for the presence of contextuality in the variational quantum eigensolver, which is a particular heuristic quantum algorithm that I'll describe in a minute. Uh, the next part is given the absence of contextuality, which we're using as our standard candle for quantum mechanics um, or quantum properties of the problem. How do you then have a purely classical algorithm? In other words, you show that the absence of this quantum property lets you write down a classical algorithm, where well, that's a well-defined idea. Um, 
And then the third thing is, in the case where you do have contextuality, how do you define a hybrid algorithm where part of the work is being done on a classical computer and only what we can identify as that the quantum part of the work is being done on the quantum computer? And I'll, I'll try and tell you how that works. Uh, I should say at the beginning that all of this uh, work lives in the land of heuristic algorithms. Uh, it's, there are significant obstacles to proving uh, polynomial scaling of quantum algorithms on quantum simulation problems because that would give us marvelous, powerful results in, in computer science that we don't uh, know how to prove. Um, but I'll at least try to be clear about where we, where what I'm saying is a theorem and where it's not. Okay, so let's talk about the variational quantum eigensolver. Um, so the goal here, we have a Hamiltonian, which is expressed as a linear combination of Pauli operators, where a Pauli operator is a tensor product of a bunch of Pauli matrices and the identity. Um, we have some set of Paulis in our Hamiltonian. The size of that set must scale polynomially in the, uh, in the number of qubits in the problem. Um, and what we're interested in doing is finding or estimating the ground state energy of this Hamiltonian. And all VQE is, is it's the Rally Ritz principle implemented on a quantum computer. So we define an objective function, which is the energy as a function of a set of variational parameters indicated here by theta. Um, that's just the expectation value of the Hamiltonian, of course, in this ANSATS state. Um, and how do we estimate this objective function? Well, we do that on the quantum computer by separately estimating each term P in the given ANSATS state. So we repeatedly prepare uh, the ANSAT state many, many, many times, and the number of different preparations is a significant obstacle uh, to doing this algorithm at large scale at the moment. Um, but And then we do the optimization step on the classical computer. So the um, advantage of doing this is that it reduces the problem of estimating the energy to a large number of small, short quantum calculations. And so you can make use of whatever quantum computer you have. And so this algorithm actually was invented as part of a project with Jeremy O'Brien's group when Jeremy was at Bristol still. Um, and it was really a sort of council of despair because we wanted to do phase estimation, which has a much more attractive scaling uh, with the energy that you can achieve. It's Heisenberg limited. Um, but we didn't have the quantum resources on the devices in Jeremy's lab to do that. And so this algorithm came into being as a way of making use of the device that he had at that time. Jeremy, of course, has gone on to found this company, PsyQuantum, in partnership with Terry Rudolph from Imperial College in London. Um, and so they're now hopefully building much larger machines to make use of in the future. So this algorithm, because it can be used on uh, devices that exist today, has in fact been used. Um, and this is a perennially out of date plot of all of the VQE experiments that have been performed to date as a function of time and the number of qubits. That's the Peruzzo et al is the work with Jeremy O'Brien's group. Um, uh, this is a Google paper. This is IBM. This is a group from Innsbruck. Uh, this is um, from Oak Ridge National Lab. Um, and then we go on and on and on. So this algorithm has been a great kind of workhorse of using these noisy, what are called NISC or noisy intermediate scale quantum devices. Um, the thing that one immediately recognizes from this plot is that the number of qubits on which this algorithm has been implemented is rather limited. Uh, many of the devices available today have um, 16 or up to 50 qubits. IBM recently announced a device with 400 qubits. And so the Google quantum supremacy experiment in October 2019 was uh, 53 qubits. So it begs the question, why are we not able to run this algorithm up to those number of available qubits? And the answer is, what I mentioned before, which is you have to do a very large number of repeated measurements. Um, you have to repeat measurements for each term in the Hamiltonian, and you have to, for each of those 
individual measurements, you have to sample many times to drive down the statistical noise on the expectation value. On top of that, these devices, these NIST devices are noisy. Uh, and so one may need to perform even more samples to run some form of error mitigation, which is also expensive. And so that limits us to, to 12 qubits or less. Uh, it's worth bearing in mind, of course, this is a plot where every point on the plot is an experiment. So there's a vast amount of energy and effort and money and time that's been uh, expended to, to do these experiments. And in each one, uh, one hopes, and I think in reality, it's really true that one learns a lot about making use of these NIST devices. Uh, I should say the typical target problems for this uh, VQE algorithm are small examples of the electronic structure problem. So they're calculating the electronic energy of molecules in usually minimal or very small basis sets. And so this is just a list of the systems that have been, uh, that have been uh, experimentally implemented in this plot. You'll notice that one of them is not a molecule. Deuteron is not a molecule, of course. Uh, that's this Oak Ridge effort, Dumitrescu et al., um, where they looked at a small uh, nuclear physics problem. OK, so let's uh, talk about the subject for today, which is how do we think about um, a particular notion of quantumness, namely contextuality, in the setting of BQE? So we want to understand where quantumness appears in this algorithm. Uh, really, there are two places it can appear. The first place, of course, is in the preparation of the ANSAT state. However, those ANSATs are usually based on some classical uh, methodology, um, some classical thinking of that's specific to the particular problem. So in the case of chemistry, they're very often based on the coupled cluster method, um, which is a well-established chemical method. And frankly, um, at the time we started this work, sort of the analysis of, of quantumness in the ANSATs, we regarded as too hard of a problem. So we wanted to, um, we wanted to just look at uh, quantumness that is a property of the Hamiltonian itself. And the simplest way to do that is to just examine the set of terms that appear in the Hamiltonian. So you just have a set of Pauli's and you're asking questions about uh, whether this set of Pauli's in, is imbued with some quantum property or not. And so the way we ask this uh, is to ask about the contextuality of a set of Pauli operators. So what do we mean by that? Well, what we want to know is given this set S, you want to construct a classical realistic model, i.e. a hidden variable model of some kind, which is made up of joint value assignments to S and probability distributions over these joint value assignments. So of course the eigenvalues of any Pauli matrix or Pauli operator are plus or minus one. If those were classical variables, you would just be able to assign the value of the uh, operator to be plus or minus one without any problem at all. Um, so if it was a classical spin system, for example, that's, that's exactly what you would do. Um, in quantum mechanics, of course, we know very well that there are two obstacles to this, at least. The first, of course, is the uncertainty principle. You are not allowed to assign definite values to non-commuting Pauli's. I and mean, generically, these Hamiltonians contain many, many, many pairs of terms that don't commute. And the second obstacle, which is less obvious, is uh, what's called strong measurement contextuality, um, which means we cannot pre-assign values to commuting operators very often without contradiction. Um, so let's just talk about the first obstacle, the one arising from the uncertainty principle. Um, so we can deal with that using an idea that's due to Rolf Speckens, which is called a, the idea of a quasi-quantized model. Here, what we do is we, um, we have the, the states in our classical model not be assignments to the variables, but probability distributions over the assignments. So we enforce by fiat a obstacle on what we're allowed to know. So the only allowed probability distributions over these, uh, these non-commuting observables are those which enforce the uncertainty principle. So if you assign a uh, very strong polarization, for example, 
to a Z uh, poorly operator, you must assign no polarization at all to an X operator uh, to make sure that, that the observable, the, excuse me, the uncertainty principle is obeyed. So that leaves us with the, um, the idea of strong contextuality, this obstacle that arises from even for commuting observables. So let's talk about that. Okay, so um, if we have a pair of commuting observables P and Q, we can simultaneously assign values to them, no problem. But then there's another issue which arises, which is by assigning variables to P and Q, you imply a variable inside assigned to their product. You, so from measuring P and Q, you can, of course, infer the value assigned to the product PQ. Um, this is because we are, we're interpreting the outcomes of measurements for these observables classically. So we think that we're just uncovering some pre-existing real assignments for these things. So here's a, just a, a trivial example. If I have X on two qubits, so I have XI and IX. Um, I am implicitly assigning uh, a value to xx. And I should say that um, by making the statements on this slide, we are signing on to um, a property for our models, which is called closure under inference, which says that when I make assignments to observables, I'm implicitly making assignments to all observables from which you can infer the values uh, from the assignments I'm making. Now, you can have models without closure under inference, and the things that the properties, of course, depend on whether you assume that or not. But we are, you know, that's just a, an assumption that's in the bedrock of this model. Um, I, I, and that's simply because I, I don't quite know how to interpret uh, being allowed to make measurements but not being allowed to make inferences from them. That seems too strong to me. Um, okay, so. Uh, we, um, it's possible that one can have sets of observables amongst which uh, one can have a, a contradicting, contradictory assignments um, arising from inferences. So that's a mouthful. So let's show an example. So here's a little set of observables. Um, so I take, I group them into commuting groups. Uh, and I can commute them into commuting groups in two ways. So I can group the ZI and IZ on the left, the XI and the IX on the left. From the ZI and the IZ, I, I assign ZZ. From the Xs, I assign XX. And then the product of ZZ and XX is minus YY. Okay, so whatever assignments I put on the bottom, they're gonna follow through this tree and I'm gonna end up with minus YY. However, I can also group into commuting subgroups in another way. I can group ZI with IX. Then I get ZX and XZ at the first level of this tree of inferences. And from those, I get plus YY. So whatever inference of the value of YY I make from the tree on the left, I get the opposite inference on the um, tree on the right. And where does that difference come from? It comes from my choice of context for the measurement. So on the left-hand side, I'm measuring the operator ZI in the context, i.e. the commuting set, ZI and IZ. And on the right, I'm measuring it in the context of ZI and IX. So the only way to construct uh, hidden variable models for this set, and this is a very elementary set of operators, um, is to have a contextual model, i.e. a hidden variable model that knows somehow not only the measurements you're making, but the other measurements you might choose to make in parallel with. That is an ugly property, of course. Somehow requires the, the classical theory to know a bit too much about what we're planning to do in our experiments. So that's the, that's the origin of contextuality that really comes out of uh, a paper by Asher Perez and then some following papers by David Merman and Perez um, a long time ago now. Um, and the famous object in this study is something called the um, Perez-Merman square, which is of which this little tree 
is a kind of tree picture is a kind of unfolding of that construction that shows that joint assignments to commuting observables can be very problematic uh, in this way. Okay, so let's, this is of course um, just a two qubit example. So the first part of this project was to try to answer the question for an arbitrary set of Pauli operators, Pauli um, that appear, for example, in the Hamiltonian. Can you, can you tell me when does an obstacle like this appear amongst those operators and when does it not? Um, of course, we're interested in that because we're interested in a particular VQE experiment. Uh, does this uh, obstacle occur and therefore prevent us from interpreting the measurements uh, in a purely classical way as assignments of plus or minus one to the, to the measurement outcomes from some classical statistical model. So we answered this um, question in 2019 uh, in a paper by myself and Will Kirby that's in PRL. Um, I'll give the references at the end. And the answer is rather nice. Uh, the set has to have an extremely particular form um, for it to not have a, uh, a perez merman type obstacle in it. It has to be the union of a completely commuting set uh, of poorly operators, which just throughout this, one has to take global symmetries of the set and separate them out. So Z is simply the uh, subset of S, which commutes with everything. So it's just the symmetries of the set S. Um, and then the, the remainder of the set T has to be partitioned into cliques uh, that have the following property that every operator in a given clique commutes and any pair of operators from different cliques anti-commute. Um, what that implies is that on T, commutation is an equivalence relation. So if A commutes with B and A commutes with C, that implies B commutes with C. Of course, that's generically not true for commutation. Um, but if it happens to be true for the particular set of operators that you're looking at, then you have a non-contextual set of operators. So that's a, um, a relatively simple statement at the end. Um, let's think about some special cases. So rather reassuringly, any completely commuting set of operators is, um, is uh, non-contextual by our definition, which is good because we would think of diagonal Hamiltonians and commuting Hamiltonians as classical in some sense. Also, any anti-commuting set, any completely anti-commuting set is, um, is also non-contextual. And then, as I just said, the most general case is when commutation is an equivalence relation. So that, with that in hand, now we can give a definition of when we consider a Hamiltonian uh, H to be non-contextual or classical. Um, and that's just if the set of Pauli terms that appear in it is non-contextual. So what that means is that one could run VQE um, and you would never run into any kind of contextual obstacle to having a purely classical interpretation of the measurement outcomes. So uh, in 2019, we then created this slightly obnoxious table where we went back and looked at the experiments that had been performed to date uh, and um, asked the question, which of these are contextual or non-contextual? And it, as you can see from the table, it's about 50-50. Um, so many of these, the no's, actually it's rather easy to understand why, uh, why these are non-contextual. And it's because these problems at the end of the day can be reduced by some transformation to a problem on a single qubit. Although that problem is encoded in more than one qubit in the actual experiment, um, these are single qubit problems. And you know, going all the way back to Bell, the very first hidden variable theory that Bell wrote down in his 1963 paper was for a single qubit. Um, and so it's not surprising that these are non-contextual. Uh, however, half of the, even, even uh, what now is four years ago, 
about half of the experiments that had done, been done to date already uh, exhibited some Hamiltonian that was contextual and therefore quantum mechanical by our definition, which is somewhat reassuring. And these numbers in the two rightmost columns are just some estimate of R's of how, um, well, the, the rightmost column here is the number of terms in the Hamiltonian, and the second rightmost is our estimate of some fraction of how many, what fraction of those terms do you have to throw away before the, um, the Hamiltonian becomes non-contextual? So that gives some kind of quantitative measure of progress. Um, I should mention that the referee felt that we were being a bit mean in uh, criticizing our experimental colleagues like this. And I, I had to point out that I'm a co-author on a number of these papers. And so I'm allowed to be mean to myself. Okay, so that gives us a yes no definition. Um, the problem is that that yes no definition is a little bit too strong. Very, very generically, if you just started writing down Hamiltonians willy nilly on a piece of paper, you would pretty quickly write down contextual Hamiltonians. Um, so, what we wanted to do next was to, to go a bit further and say, ah, well, now we have a definition of what we think a classical Hamiltonian is. Can we write down? A, one of these quasi-quantized models for non-contextual VQE. So these non-contextual Hamiltonians, it's important to emphasize, are not generically simply commuting Hamiltonians. Um, and so they do have an obstacle in them arising from the uncertainty principle, but we know how to deal with that by having probabil imposing probability distributions over the assignments that respect the uncertainty principle just by fiat. Okay, so let me tell you the punchline first, and then I'll um, I'll go th we'll go through an example to explain a little bit about how this works. Um, so the key uh, variables in our classical model are not going to be every every Pauli term in our set S. We can work with a subset of such terms. Obviously, for the symmetries, the Z. Uh, operators that commute with everything, all we need to do is identify a set of generators for those symmetries. And then once we assign plus or minus one to those generators, we have, we have assigned ourselves to a particular symmetry sector. For the cliques, we only need uh, to, uh, to consider one member of each clique. Um, and the reason for that is that I can multiply, I can pick one member of the clique, I can multiply every other member of the clique by that individual member. Those then become two operators that anti-commute with everything else, a product of two operators that anti-commute with everything else, while a product of two operators that anti-commute commutes. And so if I know which symmetry sector is I'm in, and I know one element from each clique, I can infer everything else. That's perhaps not obvious at this particular moment in time to you, but uh, it will become obvious in a minute when I show you an example. And what that means is that the Hamiltonian can be written uh, in terms of the generators of the symmetry group and the product of those generators with um, one element of each clique in this way. And so the um, expectation values which we have to assign uh, are just the expectation values of the of the symmetry operators, which are, of course are the eigenvalues. So that just assigns a symmetry sector, and the expectation values of each of these clique representatives. And there's a further restriction on these expectations, which is they have to form a unit vector, and that unit vector constraint is what enforces the uncertainty principle uh, on um, the the observations we're going to make. Okay, um, how many cliques can there possibly be? Well, it's a mildly, I would not say it's well known, but it uh, appears in at least two places in the literature, uh, but the largest size of an anti-commuting, a completely anti-commuting set of Pauli's uh, is 2n plus one for n qubits. So that tells you that um, the number of variables in your model cannot grow out of control. Um, so, 
the number of symmetry sectors, the number of generators there, um, again, grows linearly with the number of qubits. And so we have a classical objective function for optimization of the Hamiltonian on a reasonable number of parameters. And without going any further, we can immediately say that this is what, what is known in the business as a dequantization of a quantum algorithm. This has been um, uh, an interesting topic the last few years where people have written down what they think are quantum algorithms for various problems. And then that quantum algorithm has been unpicked into a classical algorithm. This is, if you like, a rather laborious and round the roundabout way of discovering new classical algorithms. Um, but this, of course, in our case, this, what we're showing here only applies to a particular subset of Hamiltonian. And it also shows, of course, that the non-contextual Hamiltonian problem is in NP in complexity theoretic terms, because I can tell you efficiently what the ground state energy is by telling you the values of this small number of parameters. Okay, so that's the upshot. So the, the, the kind of punchline is that we know how to build a classical hidden variable model for these non-contextual Hamiltonians. But let's just go through a little example here. So let's take a three qubit Hamiltonian. Um, here's the non-contextual set of terms and a remaining contextual set, which you'll notice is just uh, X, Y, and Z on the third qubit. And let's draw the picture of what the um, what the cliques look like. So here there are five cliques, um, and the completely commuting set is composed of just one term, which is zii. So each clique has size two. Um, so just by i, you can go through and just check that. I haven't made a mistake, and every pair of operators here joined by a line indeed commute with each other, and any pair of operators not joined by a line here anti-commute. Okay, so now let's pull our trick where um, if we consider the triples formed by adding, in this case, the single generator, of the symmetry group here um, to the clique, what becomes obvious here is that if, if I know ZII, if I assign something to ZII, and I assign something to one of the A's, let's say in the first clique IXI, from those two assignments, I can infer the assignment to the third operator. And I, that's true for every one of the cliques. So once I've chosen a symmetry sector, all I need to do is assign uh, a value to each of the clique representatives, which are shown in red here. And from those, I can infer the value of every other operator in every, other, in every clique. And this, by the way, is true uh, even, if you, even if your cliques are bigger than size two. Um, and so that's why we only need to assign a value to one representative from each clique. Okay, so now we've got a set of anti-commuting uh, uh, operators. Um, and if we allowed ourselves to assign definite values to those operators, um, in our hidden variable model, we'd violate the uncertainty principle. And so we reimpose the uncertainty principle by giving a probability distribution over the assignments to the, to the A operators. And so here's the probability distribution, uh, which is very simple. Um, so there's a, a set of uh, Kronecker deltas here that just selects the particular symmetry sector you're in. And then uh, a product over assignments to uh, the uh, values of A that just um, that just enforces the expectation values of these uh, clique representatives to be um, the components of a unit vector. Um, so 
the this is equivalent to just specifying um, the state by just giving the expectation values um, of the clique representatives under the constraint that the that those things have to lie in a unit sphere. So how good is this uh, approximation? Well, this is a very simple example. Uh, we've only specified here um, the terms in the Hamiltonian. Of course, the remaining information to specify the Hamiltonian of, of the coupling coefficients uh, in front of all these terms. So let's just do a distribution and look at 10,000 of these Hamiltonians and just choose the coefficients uh, uniformly on the interval between minus one and plus one. And then here we below we show the um, fractional error of the non-contextual approximation to the ground state. And you can see this is a pretty bad approximation. You, you can expect to get 25 or 30 percent error uh, for these Hamiltonians. Of course there's a tail here so it's better um, on some and it's also worse on some. And so this um, is something one could think about, uh, try and understand in terms of the, the weights that one's applying. We haven't really, we don't really think that's tremendously interesting. We think it's probably just to do with the weight that the contextual terms have in the Hamiltonian. Um, but this is uh, what you get if you just apply this to this simple example. If we go and look at real problems, particularly problems that have been implemented in experiment. Now we can ask a uh, another question, which is, of course, in an experiment, uh, the outcome of the experiment or the energy obtained in that experiment has an error. Um, and so, the uh, natural question is: Was the experiment done to sufficient precision? to outperform the non-contextual approximation to that system. So these are four of the uh, systems from the previous table, which uh, were contextual by our definition. But in three of the cases, um, the experiment was not sufficiently precise or the non-contextual approximation was sufficiently good that um, the uh, non-contextual hidden variable model was able to outperform the experiment in terms of the accuracy. And so the one surviving experiment down in 2018, in 2017 rather, was this beryllium hydride experiment, which at the time, and I don't think this is a coincidence, was the largest, um, the largest VQE experiment that had been done to date, the largest number of terms. Of course, as the number of terms goes up, um, the uh, fraction here you can see of the non-contextual terms which is only 42 out of 164 goes down and so the non-contextual approximation will get worse. It's worth noting that um, it, this, this experiment wins out not because it was a particularly high precision experiment. Um, it was, this was quite noisy because it was so big at the time and they were really pushing the limits of what they could do. Um, so this really has to do with as you scale up um, the non-contextual approximation is unlikely to win out. Okay. So both those results are somewhat uh, negative in the sense that we're um, taking a pot shot at our experimental colleagues and trying to beat them with some classical model. Um, but the, the goal here was always to try to understand the role that contextuality plays uh, in these experiments. And the aim of that was always to try to improve the algorithm in some way using whatever we can understand about that. So that brings us to the third topic, which is what we call contextual subspace VQE, uh, where we try to build a hybrid algorithm. Okay, so given what we've already talked about, given any arbitrary Hamiltonian uh, expressed in terms of poorly operators, so any arbitrary qubit Hamiltonian, we can partition the Hamiltonian into a non-contextual part and a contextual part. And we can strive to make the non-contextual part as large as possible in some well-defined sense, um, either accounting for as many terms as possible or contributing as much to the energy estimate as possible. Um, and so the, 
non-contextual ground space of HNC actually identifies a, um, a subspace in the Hilbert space uh, in which the uh, expectation value of HC can be com computed. And that's the, the notion that we're going to use. If HNC was purely the symmetries of the Hamiltonian, which is a special case, it wouldn't be controversial for me to tell you that you can solve the remaining problem uh, within a particular symmetry sector of the full Hamiltonian. In fact, that's an you know, extremely widespread way of reducing the size of quantum mechanical problems. So here what we're doing is, uh, if you like, identifying the symmetry sector of an approximation to the Hamiltonian and uh, identifying the expectation value of the remaining terms in that sector. So we have the common eigenspaces of the generators of uh, the symmetries of H and C. And in addition, we have this linear combination of the clique representatives and we work in the eigenvalue plus one eigenspace of that operator. And we minimize the expectation value of the contextual correction within that subspace. And that's, um, that obtains a correction to the non-contextual ground state energy. And that correction uh, we can prove will always be closer to the, uh, the true value. Now, there's an interesting point here, which is that even if we do this as well as we can, the result we get may still, may or may not uh, be the true ground state energy. Um, and that's something that we don't really have much handle on right now. Uh, we can show that the approximation will always get better, but the question of whether the true ground state eigenvalue lies in the subspace identified by the non-contextual ground space, uh, we, we don't know how to prove that. What we can do, however, <clears throat> is we can systematically reduce the size of the non-contextual approximation so we know at some point, the, as we do that, the, the ground, the eigenvalue will fall in this, this non-contextual subspace. Um, okay. So um, how many qubits, do, how, how does this actually work? Well, we can use a lot of, me, of uh, machinery from the stabilizer formalism. Um, the, G, the Gs, the symmetry sectors, literally are stabilizers. Um, and so each of the Gs, we can just remove one qubit's worth of Hilbert space um, by sort of standard stabilizer techniques. And this operator A, although it's a linear combination of Pauli's and so not technically a stabilizer operator, um, it also uh, removes one qubit's worth of freedom. So the, the, in the end, the way that the, uh, the problem emerges is we actually have a Hamiltonian on n minus one minus the size of g qubits, uh, which we can efficiently describe classically. Um, and so therefore we can simply run a, a VQE experiment on a smaller number of qubits. And we can, we can again drop out some of these stabilizers uh, from the non-contextual part to improve the accuracy. So we can do more or less work on the quantum computer uh, as we see fit. Okay, so now let's look back at our example. Um, so here we're gonna estimate just these three remaining terms and see what impact that has on the accuracy for our 10,000 examples. But just to remember, this is our slightly sad uh, plot of 30% average error um, for this random set of Hamiltonians. And so here's the, the details. Um, but let's just go to the punchline, which is um, if you do the non-contextual correction or the contextual correction, um, this is what the fractional error looks like. I, I apologize for not plotting these on the same scale, um, I think we, we would have squeezed everything up too much to the left. But you can see that now that all the fractional errors are less than a 10, um, and uh, we have a nice bias towards much lower fractional error. So we're doing 
uh, much better with this correction, even in the simple example, which is reassuring. So let's have a look at some real examples. Um, these are our sort of favorite uh, examples of molecular systems that we like to calculate. Why are these our favorites? Well, as you can see from the x-axis here, they're all less than 16 qubit examples, and so they're things you can run on a laptop uh, in not too much uh, time as a way of kicking the tires of the method. So on each plot here, uh, there are a number of lines. Each line corresponds to a different molecular system in a particular basis. Um, so if we look at the upper left here, uh, the blue line is beryllium. Uh, the green and orange lines are both the hydrogen molecule and the red line is the water molecule. All These are all in very small basis sets. Um, if you ask when would these basis sets have been the state of the art in quantum chemistry, the answer is probably in the 1960s or 1970s. Um, so these are really just demonstration examples. What's happening here is on the x-axis we're uh, increasing the number of qubits uh, that the quantum computer is using to do the approximation. And we're watching the uh, energy fall down. And when it goes below this black line, this is a slightly arbitrary uh, accuracy threshold that gets called chemical accuracy, corresponding to one kilocalorie per mole, that the chemists like to use as a, a threshold of whether the method is useful or not. Um, and so you can see that the 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 threshold drops down pretty dramatically until it crosses this line um, and does so for most of these examples kind of well before the end point, which represents the doing the full VQE problem. So here, these are five qubit VQE problems, but you've knocked off two qubits here. And these are 10 qubit problems, but you've knocked off four qubits and so on and so forth. Um, so you can see that there's a lot of variation uh, amongst these examples uh, of when, how many qubits you save. Um, but in all cases, we're seeing um, that we're achieving the requisite accuracy uh, before we have to use all the qubits for the full problem. So there's always some saving. This is kind of reassuring. Uh, this is the latest paper from some, um, just some, some more examples, and you're seeing more or less the same thing. This black, solid black line falls down until it goes below the, uh, the green line um, and does so before one reaches the full size of the problem. How am I doing for time? No, not that time is. Okay. So amongst this uh, business, um, we've solved a few problems. Um, so we've split the Hamiltonian into two pieces. We've then solved the classical part of the Hamiltonian. And so one has to be cautious that we haven't simply converted a very difficult quantum problem into a very difficult classical problem. Um, so let's just say a few words um, about what we're doing when we, uh, when we break up the Hamiltonian. So in the original Hamiltonian, um, we might have some symmetries of the full Hamiltonian, which here we're calling Z0, and then some other set of terms S. So now what we do is we remove some terms from S, um, and one thing that can happen is that the size of the, the symmetry space or the, the, the symmetry group can go up, of course. Um, in fact, we assume that this symmetry space in the original problem is empty. Um, and what we want is to keep doing this until we uh, have a Hamiltonian which has our requisite non-contextual structure that is uh, a set of symmetries of that approximate Hamiltonian and a what we call a disjoint pleat cover for the rest of the thing. So now the, what we can do is, what we are doing here is stating the problem in terms of the compatibility graph of H, which is a graph where there are, is a vertex for every term in the Hamiltonian and an edge between terms uh, if and only if those terms commute. So 
what we want to do is find a subgraph uh, that has this particular structure. Um, and we know, you know, you, you immediately suspect that this kind of problem might turn out to be NP complete. And in fact, max clique cover is already NP complete. So what we're doing here is a max clique cover for a subgraph with some extra constraints on, namely that the cliques don't touch each other at all. Um, so we want to, but we want a bit more than this. We also want to find the subgraph that does this, that obeys these properties, but which also approximates the Hamiltonian ground state very well, which means we should look at some information about the coupling coefficients in the Hamiltonian when we're choosing our subgraph. Okay, so let's just talk a little bit about the graph problem. Um, so there's a problem called disjoint union of cliques, the UC. Um, so you have to cover at least B of the vertices. Um, and it's easy to see that this is MP complete because if, if you're asking for only one clique, that's just the clique problem, which is already MP complete. And if you're trying to do it um, for all the vertices, then that's partition into cliques, which is also MP, MP complete. And both of those are in Garvey and Johnson there. They're two of the original 21 problems that Garvey and Johnson wrote down as NP complete problems. So this is might make you feel a bit sad. Um, but you have to remember that the before, you know, although something's NP complete, that's a worst case statement. And so uh, for, for this partition into cliques and for um, disjoint clique cover, there are a large number of graphs of classes of graphs where it's known that those problems are in fact in P, so they're efficiently solvable. Um, we also are only interested here in a heuristic solution. We don't need to find the, the best possible graph. Um, and so something that, that remains to be done um, would be to try to prove some performance bounds on the heuristics for these problems, which would be very nice to do. This is uh, something that's of interest in quantum computing in another area for adiabatic quantum computing and the quantum approximate optimization algorithm, which was developed by Eddie Farhi down at MIT and collaborated in 2014. Um, there you try to show that you have a heuristic algorithm, which will always give you a certain approximation ratio to the true best thing. And so, for example, for max cut, there's a very famous approximation ratio of 0.87 or I think, um, which was for the Germans Williamson algorithm. So that was the first use of uh, uh, semi-definite programming to solve a problem. Um, so we haven't done that yet, but that's certainly doable. Um, and you know, it would be interesting also to look at, to try and find some subset of, of uh, Hamiltonians that fell into one of these classes of graphs for which this is efficiently solvable. But we haven't done either of those yet. If anyone in the audience is interested in those problems, uh, we'd be happy to chat more or, or even happier if you just solve it and write the paper. Um, so let's think about now how we do this in practice. Um, we use a lot of information about the co coupling coefficients, which are what discriminate this from a pure graph problem. And so the simplest algorithm is we just use the magnitude of the coefficient of uh, the term as a proxy for its contribution to the ground state energy. So naturally, you think that very strong terms in the Hamiltonian are very important and weak terms are less important. Um, there's something else we could do, which is use the classical method, use classical approximate methods to actually estimate, estimate contribution of these terms, and we haven't done that. Yet. So th this plot at the bottom here uh, is again a plot of errors for different methods. And it's kind of a not wildly interesting plot. It just shows uh, the dashes here uh, are simple greedy depth first search where you just add the most important term first. Uh, the solid black line again is chemical accuracy. So all the points below the, the line here are cases where our approximate methods already achieve chemical accuracy. Uh, that might sound like good news, but actually just means that those are not particularly interesting or difficult examples. Um, but what this shows is that of a bunch of different heuristics we, we tried, which I'm not gonna go into the details of, 
simply because all of the ones we made up that were more complicated were not as good as simple depth first search. And I see I'm running frantically out of time here, but I only have one or two more things to say. The, the reason for this is that uh, these are quantum chemistry problems we're looking at. And Hartree-Fock, which gives you the diagonal contributions to the energy, to the Hamiltonian, is pretty good. Um, and you know that means that in chemical terms, you have what's called a small correlation energy, which is the, just the difference between the Hartree-Fock energy and the, the true energy. Um, and what that means is that the diagonal terms in these Hamiltonians dominate. And the depth first search always grabs all the diagonal terms first, simply because they're very big. Um, but there's also an obstacle to adding too many off diagonal terms. You can just add one, and that's fine. That means you just have one clique, which just means you've just got one clique with one off diagonal term in it. Um, but then I'm just going to go a little bit quickly here because uh, we're running out of time. Um, if you add another one, uh, it will tend to break the non contextual structure. And so you can add exactly one off diagonal term to your uh, diagonally dominated thing uh, before you start breaking up the non contextual nature of the Hamiltonian. You may worry that, oh, wait, wait, why doesn't this apply generally? Well, you could always remove diagonal terms and then add off diagonal terms. That would be okay. But when, when the diagonal terms are very dominant, this will always uh, give you a worse approximation, or perhaps it's more accurate to say that your depth first search will never do that because it will always want to keep those big diagonal terms. Okay, so let's close with one last plot. Um, you know, so if we think of this non-contextual hidden variable model as just a classical quantum chemistry approximation among a, a vast panoply of such methods, you know, how good is it? Well, the first thing to say is we shouldn't expect miracles. This non contextual condition is very strict. Um, also, as I've just said, Hartree Fock is a non contextual approximation already. Um, the only thing you can say is that because non contextual VQE is quite careful about symmetry, it can outperform Hartree Fock in cases where Hartree Fock doesn't pay proper attention to the symmetry of the problem. But again, you should be fair. Our chemistry friends know about this and can make versions of Hartree Fock that do pay proper attention to symmetry. And so we expect non contextual VQE to be comparable to those methods. Um, and this raises an interesting question, which is can you design uh, either the basis set or the partition so that? you remove this Hartree-Fock domination. Um, the plot on the right is showing the uh, error as a function of two chemical coordinates for a, the simplest chemical reaction, which is two, a hydrogen molecule comes in and collides with a hydrogen atom and forms a hydrogen molecule and a hydrogen atom like this. And so you can see that the error grows big uh, as you get away from the kind of what's called the separated atom limit. And that's just a, uh, a consequence of what I said here on the left, which is that the, the non-contextual VQE is just paying more attention to the symmetry than the particular Hartree-Fock method we're comparing against. Okay, so that's everything I wanted to say. Um, so just a few little to-do lists here, um, which as I say, uh, the first two here would be really nice. Um, we'd be very happy uh, if other people would get involved in this project or collaborate. Uh, the third thing I, I should say we are we're well along with, which is to try to develop this method so we can apply it to really large instances with hundreds of qubits. Uh, we, we're pretty well developed in terms of, of developing classical code to do this. Um, so it just remains, uh, for me to tell you the references and to thank our funding agencies, which are the NSF and um, the this DGE is a the, the Center for Graduate Training in the UK at UCL that supports our collaborators. And here are some of the references. And to just to thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Peter, for a wonderful 
and fascinating talk with many open problems. And I'm sure that there's going to be a great deal of discussion. So let me end your sharing of the screen. And I hope that people who talk and ask questions would uh, turn on their video so we can see each other. And I welcome a great deal of discussion. So maybe I'd start out and ask, um, is there a way to relate contextuality to magic or to some other measure of quantum supremacy? Uh, yes. Um, so uh, th th there's, a, uh, uh, there's a sticky technical point here, which has to do with irritating properties of the number two. Uh, so for qubit systems, um, there's the, the the situation is not totally clear. But for for odd prime dimensional qubits, there's a very beautiful correspondence between uh, negativity of a Wigner function representation of the qubit states, non-contextuality, and the absence of magic. Um, so that's really a, a nice. Um, a nice correspondence. And also, by the way, um, for those kind of QDIT systems, uh, you can handle, if you have a positive Wigner function, and I should say here that positive Wigner function means that the Wigner representation of the state and the transformations and the measurements all have to be positive. Um, you can construct a quasi, one of these quasi quantized models uh, for, that, for that sort of classical sub theory. Uh, so there's a and there's um, one has to be slightly more careful, as I said, with qubits. But there's a nice um, a nice similar correspondence. Uh, there's a, a paper, a Nature paper, I think, by Joe Emerson and collaborators, and the title is something like um, "Contextuality Provides the Magic for Universal Quantum Computation." So I see, Kaifeng, you have a question. Oh yeah. Uh... So I think following us as a question, like uh, what, what's the connection between your classical, your algorithm of classical simulation of uh, non contextuality Hamiltonian and then uh, gauss kernel theorem of classical simulation of stabilized circuits? Yeah, so um, so I don't think we have a, um, I don't think we have a very, we certainly haven't written anything that gives a very clear connection there. Um, but there's a, a number of things one can say. Uh, so previous to doing this work on VQE, um, Lucas Cossia, who actually is a graduate of the Harvard uh, chemistry department, he was uh, Rick Heller's student. Um, so we uh, wrote a, uh, Wigner function style derivation of the Gottesman Mill theorem. Um, and Lucas also came up with an approach to uh, having the Wigner functions for qubits as well, um, which is all kind of preamble to this work. Uh, I would say the difference here is that the ground states of non contextual Hamiltonians are not stabilizer states. But nevertheless, uh, they are. Um, Nevertheless, there's, there's states that we say don't have any contextuality in, um, in a particular setting, in a particular sense that we've defined here. Um, so I think there remains a kind of an interesting question to, kind of, to, to sort of really explore that distinction. Um, I might, you know, I, if I were to tell you what I, what I think we know but have not written down, um, you know, I think there's a, there's a set of superpositions of stabilizer states that remain efficiently classically describable. Um, mm -hmm. Well, uh, if the stabilizer rank is not uh, big enough, you can still. Do that's, the that's exactly right. Yeah, I, I think that's a, that would exactly be the thing to try to prove is that the stabilizer rank is bounded in some reasonable way, which I'm yeah. not sure is. Yeah, but but you also mentioned that you have the qubit version of a Wigner function. 
discrete Wigner function, uh, but you can always define the discrete Wigner function by the discrete Fourier transform of the the coefficients of the poly in the poly coefficient uh, poly de decomposition. You mean to do it? I don't know. I think uh, uh, Peter said that in qubits they also have the uh, uh, discrete Wigner function. But do you have the discrete Hardison theorem like uh, the for the qubit case? It is non-negative if and the discrete Wigner function is non-negative if and only if it is stabilized states. So no, I think but I think that's exactly the thing that's hard to prove for qubits, right? Mm -hmm. So the, the Wigner fact this is good deviating a bit from the topic of the talk but it's good because uh this paper of Yif, of lucas's deserves a bit more attention <laughs> um so lucas approached this problem in a different way uh he went back to um a paper of berezin um where berezin asked a very nice question which is what classical hamiltonian system when you apply hamiltonian quantization gives you a spin half mm -hmm. um and uh, you get a non-canonical non Hamiltonian system with three generators um, that form a Grassmann algebra. Mm. And so that's, that's, that was sort of Lucas's uh, starting point. And so all our Wigner functions are defined over these Grassmann algebras, which makes that paper very difficult to interpret. Um, although we did our, we did our best. Um, but I, what I should say is there's a, just while we're talking about this, there's a very natural project there that, that nobody has done, including us. Um, subsequent to, subsequent to, to that work, and actually in parallel with our definition of a non-contextual subset, um, Robert Rausendorf and collaborators at UBC wrote a Wigner function for qubits where they defined the Wigner function to sit on non-contextual subsets of the qubit mm -hmm. space. And it was very reassuring to us because completely independently, they also came up with the same definition for a non-contextual subset or subspace that we have. Um, mm -hmm. So that was very that was a very nice um, sort of independent uh, confirmation that we weren't barking up the wrong tree. Um, mm -hmm. And so nobody. Uh, and when I say that, I'm sort of looking at you, Kai Feng, in a way that I indicate that I think you should do this. Um, but nobody has uh, has taken Robert's uh, Wigner function for qubits and our Wigner function for qubits and tried to to establish whether they're, they're the same or whether they're different constructions. And I think that, that's something that wants doing by somebody. I see. <laughs> one, of your, one of your future students. <laughs> yeah, sure. <laughs> yeah, and also like um, 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 uh, you defined the, the non uh subset. Um, for any like quantum states, you can consider support of the quantum states in the poly, uh, in the poly basis. So you can consider the support as a, uh, as to define the, the support as the non-contextual or contextual. So, but uh, for quantum state, there's another requirement to be positive. Um, I'm thinking about like uh, if we have additional requirement of positivity, like in like uh, all the prime. A dimension case the positivity plus non connectivity is equivalent to a stabilizing is in the no in the non prime dimension case in the like prime dimensional case uh, uh I, well, I think i think in the prime dimensional case positivity and non contextuality are the same thing i see I mean, what I'm positivity is the positivity of the like the Hamiltonian is not the positivity of the Wigner function. Right, right. Yeah, I see. Yeah, because the you give the several examples of the non contextual set like commuting and anti commuting. Because commuting, if you cannot support of the um, state, uh, support of uh, quantum states. In the poly basis, it is a, a stabilized state if and only if uh, it is commuting site, uh -huh. right? Because the the the, the stabilized states are the eigen the common eigen states of some a billion subgroup of poly operators, so yes. it's supported on some commuting uh, subset of poly operators. So so as I'm thinking, like uh, if we add some positivity on the Hamiltonian, uh, it will to like make the uh, oh, I see. I see. Non-contextual to be stabilized. 
Well, yeah, that would be very interesting because that would be um, that. Would, you mean the positivity of the coefficients? Yeah. Right. So that yeah, and that would be a way of of bringing in the, the structure of the of the coefficients in the Hamiltonian of this, yeah. which we have not done, um, except in this kind of crude way of identifying the division. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you for talking. It's very interesting. Oh, <laughs> So are there any other questions, comments? Well, if not, I'd like to thank you again, Peter, for really interesting talk. And Great, thank you, for, thank, you for, thank you for the chance to talk about it. We, we, maybe we should uh, try to get together sometime in the near future. And uh, next week, I look forward to everybody coming back. We're going to have a mathematical talk with Yi Tan Chang. So bye-bye. See you next week. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. <laughs>